Hallelujah. The name of this message this morning is called uh, In the Time of Temptation. Hallelujah. In the time of temptation. You know, this, this message that God has given me is kind of a continuation from the message that I preached last, last time. Uh, it's not quite a, a continuation, but it's close. Because when I preached that message last week, or a couple weeks ago, if you remember, the lost peace. I was asked after the service, you know, some questions. And as the Lord was posing those questions to me through the, through the brother, I started, I believe that the Lord was saying, this is where I want you to go next time you preach. And so I got it that morning and started to put it together. But the Lord posed some questions. He's, you know, it's the questions that we all ask. In the body of Christ. And if you'll turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. And when you're there, please say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Romans. Got two people there. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just waiting. You know, I'm, just, I'm just waiting. Okay. Romans chapter 10, or 8, verse 10. It says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead. Now, as I was telling Pastor Jim on the way down to Oklahoma City yesterday, I was telling him a little bit about this message. And as we were sitting there talking, you know, the Spirit of God moving between, between us. God gave Pastor Jim a little revelation about something. He gave me a little revelation about something. And and today I come over this morning and was praying about it. But you'll see. But the body is dead. You can never serve God ever in the flesh. Absolutely, unequivocally, never. The body is dead. See? See? And until we believe that as the body of Christ, we're going to continue to try to serve God in the flesh. There's some things that we have to know, and there's some things that we have to believe. And until the body of Christ comes to a place, like I said last time I preached, when are we going to come to the place where we believe that there dwells no good thing in me? Because isn't that what it's about? Understanding that there's no good thing in me that can live for God. I don't have what it takes because the body is dead. And he says, because of sin, because of the fall, when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, It rendered mankind incapable of doing what needs to be done before a thrice holy God. We don't have what it takes because the body is dead because of sin. But, oh hallelujah, but, (laughs) that's a big but, but the Spirit, is life. Oh, hallelujah. And if Christ be in you, the Holy Spirit is in you. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, you have life. Because you have Christ. Because Christ is life. And you have His righteousness. Because of life. Because they are synonymous one with another. You can't have righteousness without the life of Christ. And you can't have the life of Christ without His righteousness. Mm. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken 
your mortal bodies. I'm not just talking about on that day when we were reunited, our soul and spirit reunited with our physical body or our glorified body. I'm talking about God will give you power. <laughs> it's not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I know the Pentecostals don't like hearing that. Because there's some born-again Presbyterians, Lutherans. If they're born again, if the Spirit of Christ dwell in you, if the Spirit of Christ dwell in you, He who raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken you. So those that are born again have the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He who raised up Christ from the dead shall, quick, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit who dwells in you. And for that reason, therefore, <laughs> therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Why? Because the body's dead. You don't owe the flesh squat. You don't owe it nothing. You don't owe it any allegiance, any obligation to try to live for God by it. Because it's dead. But the Spirit is life. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But we are debtors not to the flesh to live. But to trust in. To trust in the flesh. To live by the flesh. To operate in the flesh. To do by the flesh. For if you trust in the flesh, live by the flesh, operate in the flesh, who's that? You. Me. Anybody that tries to live for God in the flesh will fail. <laughs> Man, these are laws. This is a law. Oh, hallelujah. But you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, hmm, how is that done? What do you do? Can you show me how you do through the Spirit? How, how is it done? Oh, hallelujah. Boy, you got your, think, you got, got your thinking caps on, boy. I'm drilling down deep. How do you do it? How do you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body? How do you put to death the deeds of the body through the Spirit? What is it through the Spirit? What does that mean, through the Spirit? But if you do, if you trust in the Spirit who raised Christ up, raised up who? Christ. Jesus Christ. From the dead, why did he die? Because he was crucified. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. You shall live through the Spirit. Who raised up Christ from the dead? He'll quicken your mortal body. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you for your presence that I feel in this place, Lord God. For the anointing, Lord God, of your spirit, Lord God. We thank you so much. We ask, Lord, that every word, Lord God, that proceeds out of my mouth, Lord God, that it be the words that proceed, Lord God, from your spirit, Lord God, that have spoken to me these things, Lord God, that I may, Lord God, articulate them to your people. And I pray, Lord God, that they would settle down in their hearts. I pray that their spiritual ear would be open to it and it bear witness that it is the truth, Lord God, that the effectual working power of the word may do a work in their hearts by him who raised up Christ from the dead. And we give you the praise and we give you the glory for it, God, in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. And the church says, Amen. and half the church says, Amen. I said all the church says, Amen. Amen. I'm going to get you fired up. But these questions that was posed, how do I, me, 
how do I make that which Christ did on the cross work for me? That's our question. That's what we ask ourselves. How do I make that which Christ did on Calvary's cross become a reality in my life? How do I take that which Christ did on the cross for me and make it work in my heart and in my life? How do I take that which Christ did on Calvary's cross and appropriate it in my everyday life and living? These are the questions that a child of God, a truly born again child of God, asks. Every single one of us have asked the question. Because we don't want to sin against God. No child of God wants to sin against God. We don't want to do that which is wrong. We don't want to do that which is in opposition to God's righteousness because we have received His Spirit. We have received His nature, the divine nature of God. We have received the seed of Jesus Christ into our spirit when we were born again. And we don't want to do that which is in opposition to God. So how do I take that which Christ did and make it work on my behalf? Because I know as the children of God, I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years. I know the struggles. I know the fight that I've had to fight. I know what God has done in my life and where I still am struggling to appropriate what Christ did in those areas. God didn't deliver me completely from everything. But He has given us the message of the cross to teach His people. That's what He's doing through the message of the cross. So these questions that we have, how do I make it work for me? So how do I make that which Christ did for me work? How do I make God do what He said in His Word He will do? Well, I'm just getting home, hitting home. How do I make Him do it? I've asked Him in prayer. How do I make you do this? <laughs> How do I make this freedom from sin a reality? How do I make this freedom from sin an experience that I have, this experience from the freedom of sin that I desire to have, that I know and believe that I already have? How do you know you're saved? Uh, Aren't you being saved? You're saved. And you're being saved. The reality of it has not yet been seen in totality. But you have it. Jesus Christ said, Whosoever shall believe on Him shall have everlasting life. He's, he says, you shall have. You understand what I'm saying? You have it. You have it. You have it. It's your possession. Deliverance is your possession. Healing is your possession. Salvation is your, is your possession. You already possess it. So if I possess it, why ain't I experiencing it? If I possess the deliverance from sin, this freedom from sin that God says I have in His Word, why am I not experiencing it in my life the way He says I can? <laughs> hmm. These are the questions that a truly born again Christian asks. Because he finds himself doing the things that he don't want to do. And, and not doing the things that he wants to do. And he doesn't understand why I'm doing the things that I don't want to do. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why this is happening to me. I don't want, know why I am thus. I don't know why I am this way. Even we here at the Berean Assembly, who have the message of the cross, preached and taught 
in every service. Am I right? Every service. <laughs> See, some people ask, well, why do you preach it all the time? Because you still have those questions. Why ain't it working for me? Why ain't I experiencing it? Well, hang on. We've been preaching it for several years now. How many times did you hear the gospel before you believed it? That Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you. How many times did it take to hear that under the anointing of the Holy Spirit for you to say, I believe that. You know why? It takes because of the darkness of our hearts. We are, we're so, sin has done so much damage to us. We don't know how messed up we are. We think we're, we're all that. <laughs> but when you take a close examination, you ain't all that. So we hear, we're, we're preached every day. Every time that we join together, we're taught it. But we still ask the same questions. People, Sun Life Broadcasting Network, hear it around the world. Sun Life Broadcasting on the radio, internet, podcasts, wherever you hear it, wherever they're hearing it. But they're still asking the same question. Brother Jimmy, why doesn't the cross work for me? <laughs> because there's a learning that has to take place in a child of God's life. Cut yourself a break today. Boy, I feel that. Give yourself a break today. Oh, hallelujah. And depend upon the grace of God. Because you're learning the message of the cross. Oh, hallelujah. See, Ephesians 1, 17, it says that I might... Here, I'm going to show you. Ephesians 1, 17. He says that the God of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. And revelation in the knowledge of Him. There is a time when the message of the cross is preached and taught. And in that time period that it's preached and taught to us, there's a head knowledge. Hmm. <laughs> there's a head knowledge. But it... He says, and give them a spirit of revelation. See, we're learning the message of the cross because Jesus Christ is teaching His church what to believe. You have to know what to believe before you can know what to believe. And God wants us to know what to believe that is based upon the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's why He is recovering those that have been taken captive by the devil, by the message of the cross, to recover them out of the snare of the devil who have been taken captive by Him at, their, at His will. At the recovering of them if they will receive the truth. God is trying to recover us out of what Satan has filled the church with, the leaven, the leaven of the Pharisees, the law, the leaven of religion. He's trying to recover us out of, out of that snare, out of that trap, so that we can get our faith right. So we have to know what to believe before we can know what to believe. And He's teaching us. And there, there's a time period where there's a head knowledge. But God says that God may grant unto us the spirit of wisdom to know what to believe. And the spirit of revelation where it goes from here to here. And we have a revelation, oh hallelujah, that it's not based on anything that I can do. 
Because the body is dead. Oh, hallelujah. But the spirit is life. Oh, hallelujah. It's based upon what He did for me. To give me victory. I'm talking about as regards salvation and sanctification. How to live for God. That's our question. How do I live for God? How do I take what Christ did and make it work in me? How do I take it and make it work? So we're learning what the new covenant in Christ's blood actually means. <laughs> we're learning what the new covenant in Christ's blood actually is and what it's done for us. That's why I said, give yourself a break today. Oh, hallelujah. Ain't none of us graduated. I've heard people say, yeah, I know all about the cross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you do. You know all about the cross. It's not true. You ain't never going to know all about the cross. Ever. Hallelujah. So there's a time period when our spiritual ears hearing the message of the cross. Just like we heard the message of salvation. Our spiritual ears open unto the gospel. Oh, hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to our spirit that you must be born again. You need a Savior. You're a sinner. And you need to be saved. And in that spiritual ear that God gives us, because He gives every man a measure of faith to believe that. And then whenever you believe it, this is the law of faith. When you believe it, it gives the Holy Spirit His legal means. Because it's a law. He gives Him the legal means to take that old sinner out of Adam. Oh, hallelujah. And baptize him into Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. It gives him the legal means that he needs. So he takes him and he baptizes him into Jesus Christ and baptizes him into his death. And that's why in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God. Am I boring you? All right. Hallelujah. When you receive the word of God which you heard of us, you received it. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Okay? Which effectually works also in you who believe. But how? How does the word of God effectually work in me? How? How does it effectually work in me? It tells us. In you who believe. <laughs> but here's our question. Believe what? The Word of God. The Word of God has a lot to say. What do I believe about this Word? What do I believe about the Word? What do I put my faith in in the Word? Oh, hallelujah. Boy, I'm, I'm going somewhere. What do I believe about the Word of God? The Word of God covers so many things. It's so vast and full. What am I supposed to believe? Am I supposed to put my faith in my faith? <laughs> Am I supposed to do that? Okay. Am I to only believe? So, if I'm only to believe, what am I to only believe? Huh. <laughs> Going around and around. What am I to only believe? Do I put my faith in my faith? Do I put my faith in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do I put my faith in Jesus Christ? Do I put my faith in God the Father? Do I put my faith in the Word of God? I already do those things. Why ain't it working? Mm. 
I already put my faith in Jesus Christ. I already put my faith in the power of the Holy Spirit to work in my heart. I already put my faith in God the Father that he sent his only son to die on that cross for me. I already believe in the word of God. It's already there. It's in there. I already believe it. So why ain't it working? Hmm. Well, you're thinking, ain't you? That's why I preached the last time I preached the lost peace. Because the church has its faith in everything except the only thing that will work. I got my faith in Jesus. I got my faith in the Word. I got my faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. I got my faith in God the Father. But you're bound by sin. What's not working? And I got something to tell those preachers that are just fleecing the people of God. You don't have faith in God to give you those things. You are deceiving the people because you are deceived and you are using them to make yourself rich. You are not believing God because God won't give you something like a $40 million house with your, tr- with your plane and your airport and your, your runway. While the people of God are dying. The cross of Christ is the lost peace. See, what you put your faith in will determine whether you have victory or not. Boy. Oh, hallelujah. In other words, faith in your faith, we be gaining the victory. But it's not working because I got faith in my faith. It's not faith in the Holy Spirit because I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit as the power of God, but it's Still not working. Still bound by sin. It's not faith in the Word of God alone because I believe the Word of God. But it's still not working. It's not faith in God the Father and even God the Son. Don't rinse your clothes. Throw ashes on your head. It's not even those. Because if it was, it would be working. But it ain't working. We're still bound by sin. Still defeated. See, I said something last time I preached that I don't believe most of you caught because it was at the end of the message when we were getting ready to dismiss. But it was very powerful what I said because the Lord revealed it to me during that message. I said that the cross of Christ is foolishness unto them who perish, but unto us who are saved is the power of God. So, what I said at the very end was, it's foolishness to the unsaved person, right? Because what would a man hanging on a cross do to affect my salvation? It's foolishness for you to believe that. But I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. The people in the church are perishing. My Lord, I feel the the heart of God right now. The people of God are perishing and pining away because of what they're putting their faith in. Because if you don't put your faith in the right object, sin and the power of sin will dominate you and it will corrupt and corrode and erode your faith until where there's nothing left and the enemy has a place to step in and begin to lie to you and tell you how much God hates you. And you'll walk away because you can't live for God. Because we consider the cross of Christ foolishness to deliver me from sin. It's not foolishness to deliver you in salvation. 
to give to you salvation. That's what the church believes. We believe that we're saved by grace through faith in what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. But that's where we leave it. Don't leave the cross. When you leave the cross, you're leaving the only thing that will work in your heart and in your life. When you leave the cross, you're going into error. You're walking away from Christ. You can't separate Christ from His finished work. So you can have faith in Christ. But what does that mean? What about Him? He walked this earth for 33 and a half years. He did all sorts of miracles. He healed. He delivered. He set captives free. He performed all kinds of miracles. Turned water into wine. Gave Peter some money out of a fish's mouth. He did all kinds of miracles. But it didn't affect any of their salvation. They had faith. Faith in Christ. But His finished work on Calvary's cross was forgotten. And that's where the church is. We forgot it. Without the cross, it's the Son of God. It's His finished work that He did on Calvary that atoned for sin. It was His crucifixion on Calvary's cross that delivered us from the power of sin. And it was His crucifixion on Calvary's cross that atoned for sin, past, present, future, took away, delivered you from the righteous demands of the law that you could not meet, that were contrary to you, that were against you, took it out of the way. But without the cross of Christ, it would, we would still be in our sin. It didn't affect nothing. So you can have faith in Christ, but it's another Jesus. It's another gospel. And it's from another spirit. That's why I said the church believes it's foolishness for deliverance from sin. Because if it wasn't foolishness, then we would be flocking to the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Keep me near the cross, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Never let me leave the cross, Lord. Never let me leave it. But never let me stay in its foot. But the church doesn't do that. Oh, I already know about the cross. You've left it. We're running to psychologists and psychiatrists. That's what the church is flocking to. Oh, that's the answer. This fad, that fad, this, that, and the other. Everything except the only thing. My Lord. Everything except the only thing. Flocking to it. Oh, the cross of Christ can't affect my deliverance from the power of this sin. That's foolishness. It is the only thing that will work for you. So why ain't it working? <laughs> why ain't it working? It's the law that God has put in place. It's a law of what you put your faith in. You've got to understand me here today. If we would understand these spiritual laws that God has in place, if they would ever be in our mind, ever be in our thoughts, ever be before us, we could determine what the enemy was trying to do to us and what God is trying to do in us. <laughs> of how these spiritual laws work in our hearts and in our lives. Excuse me. Hallelujah. That's why our faith's got to remain there because it's illegal, the means. God gave me some really good questions today. Okay. When the believing sinner 
or the, the, the sinner is saved. Upon that believing faith, and he's saved, what the sinner believed gave him what was needed. See, this is very simple. <laughs> Colossians 2, 6 says, So therefore as you have received, so therefore as you received Christ, the believing sinner, I, I, I'm a sinner, believing what Christ did on Calvary's cross for me, delivered to me through the law of faith what I needed. I needed to be saved. And so the Holy Spirit had the legal means to deliver to the sinner what Jesus Christ did to effect his salvation. So it was delivered to him through what he believed. I'm going somewhere. The sinner heard that God sent his only begotten son into the world to die on the cross for him. And if he would believe that, he could be saved. Did he know how it worked? <laughs> Here we are. How can I make it work? <laughs> how can I make it work? <laughs> how do I appropriate it? How did the sinner appropriate salvation? Oh my Lord, this is simple. <laughs> hey, I'm a simple man. That's how God talks to me. How? And see, I know. I always go back there. What did the sinner do to get saved? Because you don't leave the cross. <laughs> you don't leave the cross. That's why God is taking us back to the cross. My Lord. That's why God is taking the church back to recover Himself. Who've been taken captive by the devil. It has been the devil that has sowed the seeds in the church to believe in the psychologist and the psychiatrist. It's the devil. Because we believe not the, the cross of Christ being our means of victory. So the sinner, he didn't know how it worked. He just felt the Holy Spirit telling him what to believe. Oh boy, I feel that. He felt the Holy Spirit telling him what to believe. This is the truth, son. If you'll believe that, I'll give you what's needed through His work. <laughs> the Holy Spirit testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not testify of Himself, but He testifies of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the means that we are delivered what we need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he didn't know how it worked. He just simply believed the right thing. He had the right object of faith. And because he did, the Holy Spirit had the what? The legal authority. The Holy Spirit had the legal authority through what he believed to deliver to the sinner what was needed. His faith was right and therefore worked. How do I make it work? Get your faith right. How do I know when it's right? <laughs> when it's not in anything else except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, it's right. When you're at the cross, oh hallelujah, looking to Him exclusively, it's right. Mm. Oh, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> oh hallelujah. So He had His faith right and the Holy Spirit Delivered to him, and it worked the way God designed it to. These were the, this is the spiritual law. Because the Holy Spirit works by faith. It's the law of faith. What you are placing your faith in determines whether you have victory or not. It's the law of faith. See, we just look at it as in the law of faith to get me saved. You believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to get you saved. But we don't believe that for sanctification. Because if we did, the church would be vibrant and powerful. But 
it ain't. Now God's teaching us, and the church is growing because people are beginning to believe the message of the cross, to understand, but there's a time period where we have to be taught. So, what the sinner believed gave to him the legal power. What, what the sinner believed gave the Holy Spirit the legal power to take the sinner out of Adam and baptize him into Jesus Christ and into his death to separate him. See, there's some things that you've got to know. And there's things that you've got to believe. You've got to know and believe this. Baptized him into his death to separate him. By being baptized into his death. That the old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be made ineffective. Might be unplugged from him. Made inoperable over him. Inoperable. That he would not have, that the sin nature would not have dominion, control, or power, or lordship over him any longer. From now on. From henceforth. At the cross. Crucified with Christ. That the body of sin being separated from that which had dominion over me. Delivered from the power of sin nature. Delivered from the power of sin. Delivered from the law which was contrary to me. And raised with him in a new way of living. The spirit is life. Oh hallelujah. My Lord. I got 15 minutes. Oh, hallelujah. So what made it work for me? Ask yourself these questions when you're asking how you appropriate. What made it work to begin with? We've been taught on Wednesdays, Pastor Jim's been preaching. Revelation. To repent. From, to remember from where we had fallen. And do the first works. What's the first works? Where did it begin? It began when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That alone. Stop doing God's work for Him. The body is dead. Stop doing God's work. You ain't God. He's God all by Himself. He don't need nobody else. He needs your cooperation to believe. Believe what? Believe this. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him. Oh, hallelujah. That the body of sin might be made ineffective in your life. That it no longer have dominion and lordship over you. That from now on, you cannot be a servant of sin. Not just the acts of sin, but that power of sin, that sin nature that dwells in each and every one of us. There's some things that you got to know. Things that you got to believe. This is a question that the Lord posed to me yesterday. He says, what if the sinner believed that Muhammad was the son of God? Hmm. What if the sinner believed that Muhammad died on the cross and was crucified for his sins? What if the sinner believed that Muhammad was raised from the dead on the third day? Boy, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Would the salvation of that sinner be affected? Absolutely not. Because if you get one aspect, oh hallelujah, wrong. What you desire to have will not be the end result. No matter how sincerely you believe it. No matter how much faith that you put in it. No matter how many hours of agonizing prayer you pray over it. No matter how many days that you fast for that sin to be come out of you. You get one aspect wrong, it ain't going to work. Oh, it's just very simple, isn't it? Oh, hallelujah. Faith in the wrong person. 
See, I know probably right now you're thinking faith in the wrong person was Muhammad. I'm talking about faith in your flesh. I'm talking about faith in you. Faith in the wrong person. You the wrong person <laughs> to have faith in. God. You can chew on that tonight. Faith in the wrong person will not give you what's desired. One aspect's changed. Oh, probably make some people mad, but that's what God's called me to do. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm a little rough. <laughs> but let me tell you something. If your faith is in Mary as a co-redeemer, it's the wrong person. I don't know. Well, and I say that with love. I say that because those that tell the truth are loving you. If I held that back... That's not love. Because if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. So I say it out of love that you may be recovered from the snare of the devil. You can't put your faith in the Pope. I don't care how many times you kiss his ring. Or I don't care how many times you are blessed by him. It avails nothing. Jesus Christ said, or Apostle Paul said, that the cross of Christ is made of none effect to you. God. Boy, I can, I, let me, hang on, let me stand back here. The cross of Christ has been crossed out. The cross of Christ has been made unprofitable. No matter how sincerely you believe it. It can affect the salvation. Because what you put your faith in either bars the Holy Spirit. <laughs> or gives Him the legal right to work. If you are believing the wrong thing. In one aspect, in other words, if you're putting your faith in Christ and Mary as a co-redeemer, or putting your faith in Christ and being blessed by the Pope, being baptized as a Catholic, being baptized when you were a child, being baptized in the Lutheran church, being baptized in the Presbyterian church, being speaking in tongues, uh, whatever you're putting your faith in with His finished work, you are nullifying the work of Christ on your behalf. You are barring the Holy Spirit from working. Why doesn't it work for me? What are you putting your faith in? It's made of none effect. It's a law. Oh, I've got five minutes. Okay. The law of the Spirit of life. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free. <laughs> you, you, you possess it. Do you have eternal life? Prove it. Can you prove it? You just simply believe it, don't you? Oh, oh hallelujah. And you have it. Has the devil ever come to you and said you're not saved? If he doesn't know what he's talking about, how does he fool people to believe that? Boy, boy, boy. That was a bomb. 
prove that you have eternal life. Feel that, man? You, you have been delivered <laughs> from sin. It's already been done. You have to believe that. You, you, you hear me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I feel this, man. Okay. Okay. So, this is why faith, what you're trusting in, what you're putting your faith in, has to be tested. You wonder why you're going through a test? Mm. See, the name of this message was in the time of temptation. <laughs> Golly, praise the Lord. See, it's easy for us to sit in here in the presence of Almighty God. Ain't no demons in here. Ain't no devils in here. Ain't no demons and devils going to sit in the presence of God in this house of God because we preach the truth and the Holy Spirit has barred His entrance. He will not achieve or accomplish anything that He desires to do in this house of God. And we sit up here in the safety and security and protection free from the powers of darkness assailing us and we're enjoying that presence of God. We're enjoying it. But here in a couple of minutes, you're fixing to leave. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. You're fixing to go home. You're fixing to leave the house of God Amen. where we gather together. And there's a unity and a corporate anointing. But what happens whenever you get alone? When you leave the sanctuary, you go out into the world, you go home, you go to your workplace today, whatever you got going on today. And you're tempted with sin. I ain't tempting you with sin. Nobody in here tempting you with sin right now. But when you leave here, here cometh the devil. <laughs> to tempt with sin. What do you do? Mm. This is James. James 1 verse 14. He says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So when you're faced with the temptation to sin, the Apostle Paul, I mean the Apostle James says, it's coming from an enticement on the outside to solicit a desire and a lust that is on the inside of you. Hmm. The temptation to sin is not sin. The temptation is not sin because he said that God tempts no man with sin. The temptation to sin is not sin. It's soliciting something from the inside of the heart. It's soliciting a lust and a desire on the inside of the heart. And we're drawn away of that lust and by the enticement on the outside. And when lust is conceived. When lusts of the heart conceive. In other words, when that lust grips and seizes the heart. And you take advantage of that opportunity to sin. That's when it becomes sin. Because that's the whole point of the being conceived in the heart. It's to grip you. So in the time of temptation, what do you do? Are y'all getting ready to leave? Oh. Oh, okay, I'm just wondering. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I want you paying attention to me. I'm not done yet. I'll let you go. I promise I'll let you go. <laughs> but that lust seizes the heart. And that temptation, it, it, it's traced back to the desire, that evil desire, the lust within the heart. The temptation is traced back there. And so what the enemy does is he puts an enticement to draw out that lust. Like Pastor Jim says, you can tempt me with liver and onions all day long, but I ain't eating it. <laughs> Why? Because where there's no desire, there's no temptation. That's why you can show me a needle today full of cocaine or speed or heroin or whatever you want. Oh, there's no solicitation. Oh, hallelujah. On the inside of my heart because Jesus Christ took it out. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't do it. Mm. There's no solicitation to do it on the inside of me. But there's some things that I like. I know, you think I'm just all holy and everything. <laughs> But he makes it irresistible. Uh. So, if it's not for the lust within the heart, Satan has no ability to ever gain the victory over you with the enticement. Right? So God doesn't hold us responsible for the temptation. Because we can't help what's in the heart, right? He has to take it out. God has to do the work. I can't help what's in there. I can't take or remove what is in there. I am not God and I don't know how to do it. Oh, you go ahead and clap. So when you, these lusts break through the barrier that God has set up in the heart to resist what barrier? Oh, hallelujah. He set up a barrier in the heart. The power of the Holy Spirit being separated from the power of sin, giving us a divine nature, taking away sin, removing it, Delivering us from the law. He set up the barriers that we don't have to trust in the flesh. We don't have to depend on that which can't do anything. But if we trust in it, the Holy Spirit can't do what He needs to do. And what happens is, is those barriers break through and we take advantage of the opportunity to sin. What happens when you go home when you're alone all by yourself? And that computer's over there with the pornography on it. What do you do? It won't work. Rebuking the devil won't work. You can have faith in a rebuke. And like Brother Jimmy says, he don't buke. It's soliciting something from the inside. Oh, my Lord. I want to get to the end of this. So this is where our faith is tested. This is where what we are placing our faith in is revealed. Boy, you can chew on that tonight too. In the time, like I said, the message title, In the Time of Temptation. That's what you're putting your faith in is revealed. Hang on. I'm almost there. So what do you do with the temptation to sin when it's right before you? And it's trying to seize your heart and 
make you do what you don't want to do. Isn't that what's happening? Because no child of God wants to sin, right? So it's trying to make you do what you don't want to do. So what do you do? Do you just say no? Like Sister Nancy Reagan said? You just say no to them drugs? Hey, I lived during that. I said no. No, no, go ahead. No, I don't, no, go, go ahead. No, just one more. No, just one more. No, thank you. May I have another? Do you just say no to sin? Well, let me tell you something. If it's easy for you to say no to sin, that thing that, that you're saying no to, let me tell you something. There's no temptation in the heart for it. I can say, <laughs> I can say no to cigarettes. There's no temptation in the heart for it. Mm. <laughs> Saying no to sin only proves that you have a desire not to do it. Man, that's good stuff. Saying no to sin only proves that you have a desire not to sin, but your desire does not give you the power not to, not to do it. Or else, why does Paul, the apostle, say in Romans seven fifteen, For that which I do, I understand not. For what I would, that do I not. But that which I hate, I do. He's saying, I'm doing the things that I don't want to do and not doing the things that I want to do and I don't understand why this is happening to me because I have a desire not to do and only to do what is right, but I only end up doing the opposite of what I want to do.